my name is Kelly. This is my first Monktoberfest. <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, my talk today, Dungeons and Towers, Medievalism, Gaming, and the Academy. Quick show of hands, how many of you have ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Yes. <laughs> you are my people. This is awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, really quick, a little bit about myself. Um, I work at a software company called Apprenda. We're out of Troy, New York, and we do private pass. I've brought, I think, a bevy of Apprendans with me. There's like eight or nine of us walking around, so you'll see a lot of us. And I am a tech writer. Someone today asked me what tech writers do, or actually last night, and I tried to explain, we translate developer speak into English. Um, which is about as accurate as I can get. Um, I also work at the University of Albany, which is the State University of New York School. I'm the assistant director at the Writing Center, and I'm also a doctoral candidate in the English department. I turned in the final revision of my dissertation two weeks ago. So I will be drinking a lot of beer this evening. <laughs> Um, and my talk today actually comes out of the work that I do for my dissertation. So I love this topic. I will try to not talk for three hours straight about it. So stop me if you need to. So today we're going to talk about dungeons, I promise. And we're going to talk about towers. But first, imagine that you are sitting in a tavern. I like where you're going. <laughs> Specifically, the Eagle and Child Tavern, or pub, in Oxford, UK, affectionately called the Bird and the Baby. And had you been sitting in this tavern in around the late 1930s or 40s, you would have run into these fine gentlemen known as the Inklings. Um, the top two are probably very familiar to you, J.R. Token and C.S. Lewis, especially Token, who we're going to talk about a lot today. Uh, Token, author of The Hobbit, author of The Lord of the Rings, author of The Silmarillion, um, all of these texts dealing with his secondary world that he created called Middle-earth. I'm, I'm positive that those of you who've played Dungeons and Dragons have heard of Togen. <laughs> so I won't go too much into that. Um, but, you know, his inventions, Middle-earth, hobbits. Hobbits are his thing. Um, Ents, languages, which we'll get back to in a little bit. And then he adapted a lot of what are now kind of like fantasy conventions. So up before Token, elves were mostly pictured or imagined as these kind of like little fairy creatures flying around, kind of like Tink Tinkerbell. Um, so Token kind of turned them into the elves that we kind of think about today and that we'll see in some of the games that we're gonna talk about. Uh, the quest, dragons. You know, he didn't invent dragons, but he did something you know, slightly different with them. And then probably my favorite, wizards. And on a kind of more macro scale, you know, Token pretty much single-handedly invented the mass market high fantasy novel as we know, know it today. Um, and he did a lot to kind of influence a field that we call medievalism. So moving on to some definitions. I've been talking about Middle Ages, medievalism, what do they mean? Well, we're going to start with the Middle Ages, a period in history roughly from 500 to 1500. Now, if you actually talk to people who like study the Middle Ages, they will argue with you about when these dates are. So I, I'm not going to say that these absolutely are the Middle Ages. This is just what I use when I teach and when I talk about it. Um, so don't, don't hold me to that. I'm just throwing it out there as a rough definition. Um, but for the most part, the Middle Ages came about by a group of Renaissance thinkers who wanted to separate themselves from the period in history immediately before them, which they saw as being kind of controlled by this very... Uh, you know, the Catholic Church. Um, at the same time, they wanted to associate themselves with Greece and Rome. So they thought of, like, you know, here, here they are, here's Greece and Rome, and here's the stuff in the middle. So there we get the Middle Ages. Medieval is an adjectival form of Middle Ages. For instance, this is a medieval illustration. And then we get medieval studies, which is the kind of, like, institutionally constituted discipline of studying the Middle Ages. Right? And then medievalist, I will use as a professional scholar of medieval studies. And then we get medievalism, <laughs> which is obviously my favorite of all of those terms, um, which I, I use as you know, any interpretation or appropriation of the Middle Ages that comes out of a post-medieval era. Right? 
Now, instances of medievalism pretty much date pretty far back. What you see in front of you is the Winchester Round Table, which was built in the 13th century um, in the reign of uh, Edward I. Henry Tudor, Henry VIII, the guy with the six wives, he actually repainted it in Tudor colors. And what you see in the middle is the Tudor rose. Um, and he actually used this as a way of, to kind of solidify his power in England by like, associating himself with King Arthur. Probably didn't even really exist. Right? So we have medievalism at work pretty early on. In the 19th century, medievalism became very, very popular um, in all types of artistic forms, paintings, poetry, novels. You could go out and buy medieval artistic de decorations for your living room right? um, and architecture. So you'll see a lot of buildings from the 19th century that you'll hear called medieval revival buildings. Um, and also there were costume balls. What you see here is a picture of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, King and Queen, or King and Prince, Con or Queen and Prince Consort of England, dressed up as an earlier King and Queen of England from the 14th century. So even the, the Queen of England was getting into this kind of medieval fad in the 19th century. Um, it was so popular among the aristocracy that they actually staged a tournament, like a jousting tournament. Um, 19th century folk having a jousting tournament would be kind of like me deciding to have a jousting tournament. <laughs> they had no idea what to do with the armor, what to do with the jousting. Luckily, it was mostly rained out, so no one was injured. <laughs> the weather stepped in. Um, and a little bit more on medievalism. Throughout the 19th century, medievalism, and popular medievalism especially, became this entity that medieval studies kind of constructed itself against. So it almost became this derogatory term for approaches to the Middle Ages that were not academic. So often it had these kind of negative, negative connotations. And with that, we're going to talk about medievalism through the dungeons metaphor. And what you, of course, what you see here is from The Legend of Zelda, one of my favorite video games ever. Um, before we get to gaming, a couple examples of some written medievalisms, novels, short stories, and the like. And the one at the bottom, George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, still not finished. We're still waiting to see how that one even plays out. So we have a, a written medievalism that's like still like being produced, still in transit, if you will. Um, medievalism on screen. Uh, medievalism appears in types of films that you wouldn't even at first think of as medieval. Uh, Star Wars is probably one of the best examples of it, right? They're Jedi Knights. Oh, yeah. Again, one of my favorite, favorite movies. And then medievalism culture. How many of you have ever been to a medieval renaissance fair? And you've seen that those people know how to joust. So that's, that's good. <laughs> or, you know, medieval times where you get to root for your favorite knight. Um, but it's, you know, it's actually a thing. And then we, get, we move on to medievalism in gaming. Um, and by gaming, I don't necessarily mean electronic gaming. So things like Dungeons and Dragons, like we haven't moved on to anything necessarily high tech yet, or Magic the Gathering, which is a card game. Carcassonne. <laughs> Carcassonne, which is kind of like a tile placing game. And then a whole like list of video games and electronic games and online games that are kind of associated and, and um, influenced by medievalism. Most of the video games that you do see, the, are, they're influenced um, highly from Dungeons and Dragons. So there's a whole, it, it kind of goes Dungeons and Dragons and then video games and the version of the medieval that you get, you can kind of like trace it, it through that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, and it's probably very, very few of you, uh, Dungeons and Dragons was a role, top, a role playing game, a tabletop one. So paper and little figures and the like um, that came out in 1974 based on a couple other strategic games. Uh, and it was purchased in 1997 by Wizards of the Coast, which kind of almost like revamped the game. I didn't actually play it until after, after Wizards of the Coast got their hands on it. Um, and since they did, there's been a number of kind of additions that kind of came out of it, so they're definitely improving it. Um, in Dungeons and Dragons, the narrative, basically everything that happens is dictated by a dungeon master who creates, among other things, the dungeons. And the dungeons can be simply what you see before you like a little, almost like the grid paper that you used to use in math class, where the little dungeons kind of mapped out, um, and each player would have a little kind of token or icon. Players would be able to kind of create their character or avatar from among a set of races and classes, 
And these are heavily influenced by fantasy texts such as Lord of the Rings, especially halfling. Um, halflings are hobbits. You might call it something different, but they definitely are. Um, elves, the tall kind, not the little tinkerbell kind. Um, dwarves, humans, rangers, and wizards, again, my favorite. So in addition to the kind of like character development, players are characterized in part by all these different kind of point values that they have. And a lot of the action in Dungeons and Dragons are dictated by dice rolls. And there you see the kind of famous, the D20, the 20 sided die. But most importantly, what Dungeons and Dragons does is it makes the medieval social. It's not just a game that incorporates medievalism or the idea of the Middle Ages, but it is this performative, socially, and locally produced medieval-esque narrative. So we have the Middle Ages not just coming from books, but it's something that people in part, and in combination with a number of other fantasy tropes, actually kind of act out and get to embody in a different way, and in ways that had not happened before especially in the Eglinton Tournament of 1839, which luckily got rained out. So now we get to video games. And I mentioned before that video games owe a lot to Dungeons and & Dragons. Um, and one of the, the things that it does owe are dungeons as this kind of convention of the Middle Ages. And the first picture, that, the first image you saw of the dungeon in The Legends of Zelda um, is, is probably the, the best picture that you can kind of get. So dungeons become something that gets equated with the medieval, even though there's nothing particularly medieval about dungeons. There were dungeons before the Middle Ages. There have been dungeons since the Middle Ages. But for some reason, dungeons equal medieval, um, to the point where there was a type of kind of online text-based game, um, not game, but kind of like communities, um, MUDs or MUDs, standing for multi-user dungeon. Also a multi-user domain, but I like multi-user dungeon better. So we're going with that. Um, and then medievalism as a, as a video game convention, along with a lot of kind of like 1980s sword and sorcery movies like Conan the Barbarian, and I'm sure you all have your favorite. I'm sorry I didn't pick that one. <laughs> That's probably the, the easiest one to go with. Um, so you, you have a lot of video games that are just uh, you know, using these themes very heavily. In addition to these kind of obvious themes, you'll see in video games inherited from Dungeons and Dragons that they'll run on a similar point system. That you'll have characters that have certain values, hit points. The dice have been replaced by kind of algorithms that are run by the game. And the dungeon master, of course, is replaced by these kind of more scripted choices. Um, and then, almost sadly, the dungeons become fixed. So where previously you would have this almost like fluid idea of what the game would be like or what the dungeon boot would be like, you have a, a game and an experience that is bounded by the actual game itself. So it's a little more, a little more um, limited almost than Dungeons and Dragons in some way. But retains a lot of characteristics such as character creation. And here you see my, again, my fav I put a lot of my favorites in here. Um, my favorite <laughs> character, my favorite uh, recent class to play in World of Warcraft, the No Morlock. Right? Um, and again, using these kind of like race and class ideas very heavily influenced by Dungeons and Dragons and, and tracing back to kind of token. Now as gaming systems advance, you end up with not only kind of role-playing games that are, are basically um, kind of like electronic versions of Dungeons and Dragons, but you get what are called MMORPGs or massively multiplayer online role-playing games, which we've already heard about in a couple of the earlier talks today. And I assume a lot of you have played them here as well. At least I hope you have. Um, World of Warcraft is, is my personal favorite. I've also you know, played Guild Wars and the like. But in addition to MMORPGs, we've seen medievalism pop up in a lot of what I would call social media games, such as Castleville or Game of War or Clash of Clans. And you'll see television commercials for these on like, fairly frequently. And if you kind of pay attention, then you can kind of see the medieval tropes in them. So no longer necessarily role playing, but you've got you know, the whole world and whole premises that are being used to kind of create these games um, where people are kind of interacting with each other. So the social is almost displacing the role playing as almost the important element of the game. Um, this happens to be uh, my mother's Castleville kind of <laughs> screenshot. I told her I'd work her into this talk somehow. <laughs> um, and I thank her for sharing her screenshots with me. <laughs> So what we end up with is 
a, an idea of the medieval that is very highly socially produced. Um, and people today understand the Middle Ages not necessarily from what they learned in school or ideas specifically of history, but all of these different texts that surround them, and especially, you know, for me, gaming is one of the more, most influential of these. Um, and what we end up with is that concepts such as dungeons which, that are not necessarily medieval get associated with the Middle Ages almost inextricably. Another example of this is princess culture, especially as produced by Disney. Right? That for some reason, Disney is associated, associated with medieval or the Middle Ages, even when a particular Disney film is not necessarily medieval. So we have like, you know, things like princesses and dragons and dungeons all become medieval even though they aren't necessarily medieval, which is kind of cool. But also, the medieval ends up being used anytime that we're looking for a counterpoint to the modern. Right? <laughs> and the best example of this... <laughs> <laughs> the best example of this that I could come up with, which I actually borrow from uh, Carolyn Dinshaw, who's a professor at NYU who studies these types of things, is you know, like the term, I'm going to get medieval on your ass. Um, it, does, it has currency, it means something, and it doesn't mean something very nice. <laughs> about dungeons, we talked about this kind of socially produced idea of the medieval. Let's turn a little bit to towers. Um, this happens to be a tower from Magdalen College in Oxford. It, it kind of is the ivory tower. It's like the ideal emblem of the academy. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about medieval studies, which is the, the discipline that kind of studies the Middle Ages as like its subject. Now in the 19th century, it became kind of solidified as an actual you know, discipline, as a thing. Um, and the primary approaches to studying the Middle Ages would be things like history or philology. For those of you who have never heard of philology before, it's okay. It's not really a thing anymore. Um, but it's the study of languages and the history of a language. Um, and it, you can kind of see how that almost like archaeological approach to language should go hand in hand with history and mythology and with archaeology. And what was a very strong impulse in the 19th century to be able to uncover history and to uncover the past like as it really was. So there's this idea that the Middle Ages were this real thing um, and all you had to do was go and if you, you dug enough and if you read the text carefully enough, you could actually find out what it was and learn about it. So this is the field where Tolkien kind of lived and worked in and wrote. He actually was a philologist. So this Lord of the Rings thing, that was his side job. That is what he did in his spare time while he was at the bar with his friends, drinking beer. Um, and for his real job, he, he was the... Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford. Anglo-Saxon is another term for Old English, so it's a very, very kind of old form of English that's almost Germanic. He knew not only that, he had like a very, very deep knowledge of a number of different languages, like Latin, Greece, all of the Romance languages, German, and that was just for like starters. He would actually go and find obscure languages to learn about because he was just fascinated with their structure and you know where they came from. In addition to writing fiction, he also had, he gave a number of very famous and important talks. Um, the two I have up here are probably the most famous. My personal favorite, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. How many of you had to read Beowulf in high school? I think Tolkien read it when he was like five, probably in the Anglo-Saxon. And he liked it so much that he decided to become an expert in Anglo-Saxon and in other languages. Um, but he, his contribution to medieval studies is almost as great, if not greater, than his contribution to like high fantasy and medievalism. Um, he actually argues in his lecture that we, and by we he means like medievalists, ac academics, need to read Beowulf as an actual poem and as a work of art, and not just as an artifact that can be used to kind of uncover the past. And this is actually a very kind of important step and, and it points to an important change in medieval studies where suddenly we're, we're looking at these things as things that are w worth studying in and of themselves and not just because they're old, but they can tell us what happened like a thousand years ago. Now, Tolkien himself, Anglo-Saxonist that he was, kind of was very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? 
he didn't really want to talk about his fiction. Um, and this is a quote from him from one of his letters, where he was actually astounded that he was successful as a novelist, but he had no idea how to put his identity as a novelist and his identity as a professor, like an English professor, together. And you can see this kind of very self, almost self-deprecating quote where he's like, you know, the university just doesn't know what to do with me, right? Because, you know, I'm writing these novels. Um, but then he kind of, this is the end of that quote where he kind of turns it on his head, where he actually points out that the Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, for him, was not really a side job. It's something that he came out of his love for language and that his work as a philologist, where he's learning all of these languages and he's fascinated with medieval languages and medieval culture, that actually becomes the basis for Middle Earth, for the Lord of the Rings. So that the first thing he does when he starts building out Middle Earth is he starts creating languages for them. And he created about 10. I've, I've never even created one language. <laughs> Wait. I'm still trying to master English. And he, you know, he's got 10 of them. And the two most kind of developed are his elven languages, um, you know, Kenya and Sindarin, which are, are based on uh, the languages that he studied that he just kind of really loved. And he wanted to model a new language after them. Um, and notably, he did not just develop these languages. He gave them a history so that if you ever look at, like, say, the history of the English language and you see how it changes and is like there are changes in inflection like over like centuries, he provided that type of history for these languages. So it's, it's absolutely just fabulous from kind of that point of view. Now, luckily, since Tolkien's time, there have been a lot of changes in the academy and in medieval studies. Um, for instance, the concept of being able to access the real Middle Ages has been questioned. And that's not necessarily just a change in medieval studies, but it has to do with influences in the academy from like post-structuralism, post-modernism, the idea that, that there isn't necessarily always one right answer for things, um, and the wider acceptance of studying popular culture within the academy. Right? So it's kind of like, like suddenly medieval studies is not just worried about like old things, but things that are happening now, which is very, very good. Um, and both the Middle Ages and the idea of the medieval are critiqued as constructs, as things that were in and of themselves kind of invented, which they were. The idea of the Middle Age was kind of invented so that um, people had a way of talking about the past where they could separate the parts that they liked from the parts that they didn't. And because of this, the medieval studies, medievalism divide becomes much less rigid. And this is a quote from Les Leslie Workman, who is, was a scholar in medieval studies who basically did a lot of work to try to make medievalism itself part of like, the academic world. And his idea on what medievalism was is that it is the continuing process of creating the Middle Ages. So if the Middle Ages were something that were kind of created to begin with, we don't necessarily have to go back to that initial iteration of the Middle Ages. Um, what we are actually doing is we're continually recreating them kind of over and over again depending on what we need them to do at any given moment. And for him, this idea of the medieval as constructed is equally applicable to popular medievalisms and medieval studies. A lot of medieval studies professors did not like this idea at first. Um, but I think a lot of them found video games. <laughs> <laughs> they, they realized how fun they are. Uh, and so you end up with these professors uh, playing video games, writing video games, and other, uh, writing about other popular texts, uh, especially technologically advanced medievalisms, and coming up with new terms such as new medievalism, which is what my dissertation is on. Now, and as academics start kind of writing about these things and publishing about these things, it becomes more acceptable to, say, write a dissertation on medievalism. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and to... To, for hiring committees to hire people who, who do this as their profession and to kind of give tenure to that. So what does this all mean for our dungeons and towers metaphor? Well, medievalism and medieval studies are still very much separate entities. We still have universities, we still have towers, we still have dungeons. Um, they're less distance from each other. And there's a couple places we could go there. We could, we could do the what can the academy learn from gaming and medievalism. We can do what can gaming learn from the academy. 
But for me, the most interaction, interesting direction we can go is the spaces where all of these things kind of overlap. Right? So not necessarily that one group has to learn from the other, but there are you know, the spaces kind of in between are where we can learn things. And some of the, the more interesting um, and I think important work that I see being done is that the university has centuries old set of kind of critical apparatuses that they use to kind of critique different things. And being able to apply that to something like gaming, right, especially as gaming becomes more technologically advanced, um, it has been, it has, to my mind, yielded some of the, the actual best academic work that I have read. It also encourages us to kind of have this critical eye towards how, why we are producing this idea of the Middle Ages in a certain way and how. And for the most part, when you're talking about gaming, it's to make money. And money is always important, right? So we don't want to ignore that um, at all. And then this, this is probably one of, again, my favorite. Um, I have seen this tendency in medievalist scholarship to kind of idolize technology to the point where I have seen um, one of my colleagues has compared developers to magicians or wizards. They think that programming is magic. And it kind of is. I'm not going to dispel that. I don't want to upset anyone. But at the same, <laughs> at the same time, it's, it's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of labor that goes into that. And working in a tech company, I've actually seen that. You know, I've seen people work their 80 hours or 100 hour weeks. Uh, we don't make video games, but I can't imagine that the companies that make video games are much different, right? Um, and at the same time, I have seen in the kind of tech world that I've also kind of moved in, I have seen the stuff that I do almost seen as kind of like idealized, as, as kind of magic, right? Like I know Latin, that's seen, seen as like weird. And, but also to, to look at it in that way also kind of belies the fact that there's a lot of work that goes into the production of scholarship into these ideas. And finally, uh, gaming, especially medieval gaming, is one of the best ways to teach medieval studies, especially to 18 year olds. Um, if you have a class where you start with Beowulf, you lose half your students. You have, a start, you have a class where you start with World of Warcraft, you can't keep the students out of the door. And then you teach them Beowulf after they're already hooked. So it's actually quite a strategy. Uh, but also, to my mind, these texts are in and of themselves like, very, very worthy of study. That these are things that we should be lo looking at and learning about and teaching about. And finally, this socially produced nature of medievalism, to my mind, actually offers this space to kind of move beyond this like dungeons and towers divide. So you've got your towers up here, you've got your, your dungeons down there, and in the middle you have the pub, you have the tavern, you have the place where these things can meet, um, and you throw in a little bit of beer, and suddenly it doesn't really matter who's a professor, who's a gamer, right? Everybody's version of the medieval kind of gets to count more equally. Thank you. Thank you.